and welcome to First Bite, the Detroit Lions Pride of Detroit midweek podcast where we are right in the middle of our Lions review draft series. Uh, we've gone through the first three draft picks. Now it's time to enter round four and talk about USC wide receiver Amonra St. Brown. Before we get into all that, my name is Jeremy Reisman. I am the editor-in-chief over at Pride of Detroit and your co-host for First Bite. With me, and I know you, he was very eager for this episode, Chris Perfett is here, former USC Trojan himself. Chris, how you doing? Buddy? I was actually going to stream some NCAA football today and just be lazy, but Ryan wanted to bail, and I'm like, all right, fine. Yeah, let's go back <laughs> and uh, – to my to my source of the thing is is like i think there's a the running gag now on the podcast that i'm a usc homer when for as long as i can remember now this football has brought this form of football under clay health has brought me nothing but pain and suffering so hey but hey we got amon ross st brown so i'm I'm you are a usc fan yeah you know That third voice you hear is a very special guest, and we're going to call him an Amon Ross St. Brown expert for now. He is the uh, the USC beat writer for the LA Times. It's Ryan Karchi. How you doing, Ryan? I'm doing great, guys. Th- thanks for having me. I'm, I'm happy to come on a Detroit pod. I don't think I ever have. So, big yeah. deal for me. And, and that what makes you an even more special guest is you're, you're a, a, a self-proclaimed Michigan man, a graduate of U of M. You're sporting the Detroit D hat right now. Uh, I was going to say he's got some clippings for some Derek Robinson stuff in the background, too. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure if you can see the Red Barons and Michigan hockey coach. <laughs> nice. Uh, <action> back there. <laughs> yeah. Spent some, some good nights over at Yost Arena. For sure. Oh, yeah. Under Underrated – like I kind of liked my nights at Yost Arena a little bit more than the Big House, if I'm being honest. College yeah. hockey is a fun experience. It's a damn fun experience like that. And there was no one quite like Red Berenson too. He, uh, I learned a lot about journalism just by being around that guy. Sure. Um, well, let, let's get into it. Let's talk about your your journalism days over there at USC and specifically Amonra St. Brown. Um, because he's, to me, one of the more fascinating picks the Lions made because he's one of the more fascinating people. And that's what I want to get into first is just – Monroe St. Brown, the person, the the guy speaks a ton of different languages. He he has a fascinating dad who who peddles his own you know weight weight gain stuff, and his brothers in the NFL. So um, just talk to me about what your impressions of Monroe St. Brown as as a person. Well, like you said, it, it is just a very unique family. I mean, I, I think just their names alone <laughs> says say a lot. You know, his brothers were Equinemius and Osiris mm-hmm. St. Brown. Uh, and Equinemius's middle name, I think, is Imhotep, too. So they're all Egyptian gods. Yeah, there's a lot of Egyptian action going on in all those names. There's several long middle names to go with it. He's not <laughs> the only one. But uh, but yeah, Amun-Ra, uh, you know, he, he was kind of described to me in terms of his place in the family as really the competitive, serious one. Yeah. Uh, and you can really tell that just kind of being around him. He's very focused. He's not really like a light, sort of like light energy kind of guy. He's like very intense. And you can tell that he gets a lot of that from his dad, obviously, who, you know, is a, was a world famous bodybuilder at one point. Um, and like you said, now, you know, has his own line of, of protein that he certainly uh, spends a lot of energy peddling. And I know his, his sons do too, but it's a, you know, just the fact that, you know, his name is actually just John Brown. They added the saint to just make their names seem more interesting on the back <laughs> of a jersey, which, again, I think it really just says a lot about that family. But they're, they're a very interesting crew. I mean, like you said, he, he only spoke German with his mom and he, you know, they speak multiple languages in the house and it, it's clearly a family that, you know, knew what they wanted with their kids from a very early age, set out to create those kids in the, that exact image. And, you know, it seems to have been going pretty well. I mean, two yeah. wide receivers in the NFL currently and Amon Ra, I, I think personally will, will certainly be the one that goes the furthest. I know Equinemius has had a little bit of action in Green Bay, but the but I, I certainly think Amon Ra has the most skills of all three. Yeah. And I know, like, as you say, he, he got a lot from his father. Apparently, though, from what I was reading, not his father's love of singing Journey in the car, which was apparently <laughs> used as some sort of form of torture, I would imagine. <laughs> uh, I'm, did I say, yeah, foreigner? Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I kind of, but just to that, 
nature. I just, I'm curious what drives a lot of that competitive nature. If that's his father, his brother is a chip on his shoulder that he's being serious. Cause I remember, you know, midnight after day two of the NFL draft, he's working out and posting on Instagram and you know, oh God, that's, that's usual for a lot of people that would be like, Oh, what rubbish. That's usual kind of, you know, gr- rise and grind, grind hard stuff. But it felt like for him and given what we know about his own kind of habit of bodybuilding that felt legit that felt like just get out there and just keep working just if nothing else to burn off the stress yeah certainly I I think that's just kind of his personality uh like you said I'm often more skeptical of that sort of approach like the whole like yeah grind to like whatever sort of (laughs) approach but he like really is that guy I, I think you know he's from a very young age I think he was I want to say he was five or six years old when he started weight training yeah, with his dad yeah. so you know whether that's healthy for a five or six year old <laughs> you, can, you can debate but uh it seems to have worked out at least at least in that situation yeah i mean he seems like the kind of guy who has the rise and grind mentality but doesn't hashtag about it like he's he's just all about yeah. the work he's not about the flair yeah no he and he was he's never been someone who is like flashy in that sense i know right. i thought it was a big moment for him uh, this past last summer uh, during the Black Lives Matter, uh, just protests and all that uh, unrest going on that he actually made a big show of the fact that he went to a protest and like really took a stand on that and was kind of talking more about social issues. And that was very rare for him Hmm. because he was consistently like, football is it, I'm focused on this, that sort of thing. I, I, I thought that was interesting that he kind of took the time to step out of his comfort zone a little bit and talk about that. Yeah. Um, it, it's interesting we say all this because I, I wrote a note for myself that says he, he carries himself like a 10-year vet, and it sounds like that's kind of what, what you're seeing as well. But I'm interested in how he kind of um, worked as a leader for the team because he was named captain in, in his final year there at USC. So was he just kind of like more the silent, serious, lead-by-example type, or, or is he a kind of guy that can get in the middle of the huddle and, and, and get the, the troops fired up? Uh, I would I would say he's probably more of the lead by example type, just for all the reasons we've been saying. You know, it's kind of been ingrained into him from the beginning. Uh, that's not to say that he can't be a leader. I, I know we saw that certainly a little bit with the receiving core last year, but I do think one interesting thing about Amon Ra, especially as it pertains to the last season, because it, it seemed like his stock dropped a little bit uh, heading into this past year and. I thought it was interesting just in the sense that he, you know, I, I knew that he was really focused on getting to the NFL. I mean, he really thought a lot about leaving and sitting out this season. I think if the PAC 12 would have delayed any longer, he probably would have just not played. Um, and I think a little bit of that sort of colored his performance at some points in this past year. But that said, I mean, you know, he was sort of the, just the lead by example guy in that group. He was not where you see some receivers being flashy. That was not him in the slightest. And I think it was always just, he was programmed that he was going to go to the NFL when he was ready. And I know his dad, his dad's thought he's been ready for several, (laughs) several years. Uh, But uh, it, it, that certainly seemed to come to a head this year. Uh, But I did think that, you know, he showed clearly, especially with, I think with how his relationship with Keaton Slovis, um, they had a great relationship. It seemed like he was always kind of that reliable guy that Keaton could could find. You know, he was always seemed to be open. So, uh, I, so yeah, I would say he's definitely more of a lead by example guy. That's that's something I wanted to bring up too because he got recruited out of Modern Day High School in Santa Ana with originally it was J.T. Daniels who was you know the quarterback at Modern Day who was the big splash name that USC recruited. I even remember him like being interviewed on AM 570 here in Los Angeles. And then, you know, Daniels gets hurt and then it's Keaton Slovis in. So like, was there, I I imagine Amon Ra kind of went to USC to keep playing with JT Daniels. What did he make any kind what kind of, did he have to make any kind of adjustments there or he just fit right in with Keaton? Yeah. I mean, he really did. And I, I, think again it kind of speaks to just how he acts like that it didn't really phase him that JT even though JT was definitely one of his closest friends it didn't really phase him that uh he was replaced by Keaton and uh they really Keaton and him just really picked off you know right where JT had left off and it's 
you almost like the word robotic kind of comes to mind a little bit when it comes to Amon Ra. And I, I mean that in a good way, in right. the sense that like, he's not going to be affected by his environment. Um, he's just, you know, going to do the same thing no matter what. So maybe that makes him a great fit for the Lions, I guess. <laughs> maybe. Yeah. It almost seems like it may be a better fit from for the pre- previous regime. It was just oh, like, yeah, maybe. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like no, no yeah. emotions. Don't, don't show anything. But, but I um, mean, Lions need receivers. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, that's USC always though has a great crop of receivers always seems like it's, it's what they pride themselves on. It's their star power. But what kind of really set him apart from the rest of the pack in that whole wide receiver core at uh, at USC? Well, he was just very polished, I thought. Um, you know, he's not the fastest guy. Uh, you know, he's not the most, like, physical or most athletic. Um, but, you know, in terms of his route running, um, in terms of just his reliability and consistency, I mean, there's a reason why he, you know, led – he was such a presence as a freshman. I mean, he stepped in immediately and was arguably, if not the best, the closest, second best uh, receiver on the team. And I think that says all you need to know about him because he can sort of rise to that level right away. He's not going to, you know, be super on one day and then off the next. Uh, He's had that consistency throughout. And I think that really just kind of gets back to his training. And uh, I, I honestly, even aside from just the fact that I know the Lions as well as I do, but uh, I just thought he was a perfect fit in that sense, just because he is kind of the later round guy that can step in right, right away. And yeah. I think he'll be able, he has the IQ to understand how that all works immediately. Now, whether his ceiling is as high as some other guys in this class, I think is a fair question. But, um, but yeah, I mean, just in terms of his polish and just his ability to get open. I mean, it's sort of, you know, it's not a great way of putting it, but like, he just has a way of finding his way open. Um, and I think that showed just by the sheer amount of catches he had, no matter who the quarterback was, he was pretty much anyone's favorite target in any given year. So I think that that certainly says a lot of just about his consistency week in and week out. Yeah. And I, th- I think it's interesting you bring up the point that he could be kind of that uh, immediate, you know, impact player for the Lions, uh, not only because, you know, their, their depth chart isn't, isn't great right there, but because he is so polished and, and maybe those skills translate quicker. And and it seems like the Lions knew that because if, if you saw their latest, you know, behind the scenes draft video, they were talking about Amon Ra on day two. Mm-hmm. And he was part of their plans. And they're like, we, we can afford to go defensive line early because this wide receiver class is deep. And specifically, they say that USC kid and, and, by all means, it, it had to have been Amon Ra who they were talking about. So I, I think that's an interesting point. Um, was there a moment when he was, you know, fresh on campus, uh, and when, or maybe when you were fresh on the beat, when he stuck out? Like just a moment that you're like, okay, this guy's this guy's headed to the pros. Uh, you know, it's tough because, and I think this past year, this is probably not the best example because he'd already been around for a while, but he had this this game against Washington State this past year where it was just clear that no one could guard him uh and Washington State tried to play zone against USC and they just absolutely torched them and Amon Ra was you know the main uh, beneficiary of that you know he ended up with four touchdowns in that game um and just the way he took over that game was it, it was just one of those moments where you're like this guy is the best player on the field uh that certainly comes to mind and one thing I think, and I, I think I even mentioned it when I talked to you guys before, was that, you know, there was a game in his sophomore year in which USC was completely out of running backs. And to open the game, they actually moved, they shifted Amon Ra from the slot into the backfield yeah. and handed it off to him. And he ran for a 38 yard touchdown. And he, that run, I think it shows you all, his skills in terms of ball skills like he you know he jukes a guy he spins around another guy like he runs through contact like this is a guy who could have been a running back if he would have put on more weight and just been like you know just trained differently apparently from age five I guess but uh, (laughs) but yeah he in that game you know he was one of their leading rushers and also one of their leading receivers and he didn't even bat an eye. Uh, and I know they, they never really went back to that again. They got some of their running backs back, but the fact that he could just step in that week and immediately sort of know what he was doing, I guess, was 
just kind of, sort of a telling experience for me. Yeah, and that, and that Washington State by, game, by the way, all four of those touchdowns came in the first quarter. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yep. I think he had five catches and four touchdowns at one point or something yeah. like that. It was ridiculous. ridiculous. Um, All right, let's take our first break. When we come back, we're going to talk a little bit more about his projection to the NFL, his fit with the Lions, and everything else that Ryan Karchi knows about Amonra St. Brown. So stick with us on First Bite. We'll be right back. Do I have a second to grab a charger? Yes, absolutely. We actually spend a couple minutes with our our live chat. So grab grab us time. Yeah. All right. Sorry, I had an email in the middle of that there, too. All good. How are we doing, Chet? It's uh, Thursday night, a little later Hi. than we normally go. Hot as hell. Um, <laughs> grab an ass. Yeah, sorry. This I know Apex. I know usually, I think this blew up my uh, stream for the night, but that's all cool. That's all good. We'll make it more. Josh has been asking for a while who's better, Equiminius or Amon Ra. I, I mean, that's hard, man. Like, Amon Ra hasn't played a down in the NFL yet. <clears throat> I mean, Ryan seemed to suggest he has a, a, a much higher ceiling oh i should also catch up on alerts here sure i think i think he was the higher rated versus equanimius sure uh cordy aaron with the 20 months says 20 months has poggers that's that's twitch language that people say Mm -hmm. then no decaf that guy over there i I found my old i found my old brands like twitch name i don't know who has the email (laughs) right now so i'm desperately trying to find it because i'd love to get it back and finally get a handle that makes sense but (laughs) Well, thank you for the the eleven months using that Twitch yeah, Prime. Yeah, 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 it cost me nothing. Yeah, it cost me that, nothing. That's a good reminder. Me. If anyone has Amazon Prime and is here on Twitch, they can link it to their Twitch account and subscribe for free. Support the channel. Appreciate that. Uh, and then Uncle Indigo came in with the thirteen months in a row, almost a year and a half, because fourteen total. Appreciate that as well. Um, we we can can you take a couple minutes to answer some questions before we jump back into things, Ryan? Sure. Uh, great. Um, so. I have some thoughts. I have some thoughts too, as far as like this question too, if we want to just round well, table this. Well, we can start with the, the equanimous versus Amonra debate. You kind of mentioned it at the top there. You think Amonra kind of has a higher ceiling at this point? I would say so. I mean, equanimous, how much has he really done to this point? I mean, like I know one touchdown. <laughs> yeah. yeah, not, not a ton. Yeah. They're built very differently. So I, I do think, just the way Amon Ra is built sort of lends himself to a little bit more of like contact that helps him. Um, I don't know. Cause Equinemius is a little bit lankier, right? Yeah. I think the I question he was, he was also saying like, what was kind of the difference between them coming out of college too. And I'm just kind of pulling up some of their stats. Cause I know Equinemius was like a six round pick yeah, out of yeah. Notre Dame. So Amon Ra has got him beat by like a, a round. So um mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean they're completely different receivers. Like, yeah, like yeah. Said, I mean six five two fourteen is Equinemius yeah. and same and Amonra is what five ten five eleven. So yeah, yeah. I think Equinemius was kind of more just kind of a bit of a bit more. A, I don't want I don't want to say specialized the slot or anything, but I mean Amonra put up. Yeah, I mean Amonra put up like eight hundred more yards through college. They definitely used Amonra a little more heavier than they used Equinemius in Notre Dame. Who was there with Equinemius at the same time, wasn't Ooh, it? Oh, that's a, so that'd been 2015 to 2017. And Notre Dame goes through so many damn quarterbacks. That'd be, um, <sighs> that, that would be after Malik Zaire. I know that much. Deshaun this is the funny thing. I'm a USC yeah. guy, but my whole family is, uh, is Deshaun Kaiser, Notre Dame. Like. Wow. Was it Deshaun Kaiser? Mm-hmm. Okay. That has to have been his like senior, you know, that was his sophomore year for Deshaun. Damn. Hmm. Yeah, I think Equinemius was drafted largely on his size. Yeah, that, right. Yeah, that would have been like Deshaun Kaiser and and a little bit maybe near the end of Ian Book. And what maybe num- some Brandon Wimbush thrown in there for good measure, too. Great Darkness asks, what number will he be wearing? I believe he was wearing 14 at minicamp uh, based on my memory. I don't have a roster sheet by me. That's right. But I think that's right. <clears throat> um what was the other one um i'll wait to we'll talk about the slot a little bit when we get into it um there was one more i wanted to look at i lost it um we can just get back into it then we don't have too many questions here i think it was just yeah all right let's get back into it then i am curious how cyrus is gonna do out of stanford but uh he sort of fell off the map 
Kind of yeah, thing. I think again, part of that's just the Pac-12 fell off the map too, but yeah. and Stanford fell off the map, so it's kind of like a a triple falling off the map, really. Yeah. <laughs> yes, there is. It's Osiris St. Brown. He is currently playing at Stanford. Okay. Yeah. That's to uh, Scuba Steve's question. Yeah. <clears throat> All right. Give me a second here. We'll get right back into it. And we are back here on First Bite talking about Amon Ross St. Brown, the Lions fourth round pick here with Ryan Karchi of uh, the LA Times, USC beat writer. Um, let's talk a little bit about his projection to the Lions. We, we covered his time at USC pretty well. Um, I'm, I'm curious as to your thoughts on, on how he projects to the NFL. Um, and, and, and I guess I'll start with my thoughts um, simply because I remember trying to, you know, scout him after the Lions picked him, look at his film, things like that. And the one thing that stuck out to me is he, he doesn't necessarily have any elite skills, but he's pretty darn good at everything. Do you think that's that's a fair assessment? Yeah, yeah, totally. I, I think that is probably the best assessment. I think that's <laughs> and that I think that's why he fell. I mean, mm -hmm. especially in a class of receivers that have a lot of elite skills, like the guy who is real is good at everything but not great, uh, certainly falls by the wayside. I think and. You know, that's when you try to like even when I've been asked about any standout skills like I have a hard time sort of coming up with an answer because the answer really is just that they're all kind of a part of the product right? right like he's not missing anything and I guess maybe like top end speed right. would be the one thing that you know he doesn't necessarily have but the way he makes up for that like he, he is quite good at like just his route running and just the, the damage he's able to do just in the intermediate area, uh, I think, and I think that sort of thing translates right away. As long as you know he's not the guy that you, you know, send on a fly route, then like if you know how to use him correctly, then he can be used like pretty well to like in any position. I, I know you mentioned like the slot a little bit, like that's, I certainly think that that position is kind of taken takes advantage of his skills a little bit more, but he can play on the outside too, as he showed this this past season. Yeah, I know a lot of Lions fans kind of look him at him as a slot receiver. And I even remember on draft night, some people asking, like, why are we taking this guy when we've already got Quin when the Lions already have Quintez Cephas? But as you say, I think he's just he, he's more than just a slot guy. He's more than just a big body in the slot. He's got kind of everything. Yeah, definitely. And he played you know, both inside and outside when he was at modern day and, you know, did damage from both. And I know USC just happened to have Michael Pittman, right. For a, a while yeah. along with Amon Ra and they didn't necessarily, and, you know, Michael Pittman is very prototype outside receiver. So it made a lot of sense to keep him there. Um, and I do think, you know, I, I think like our perception of how that works is changing a little bit more than it, it was at one point with football. Right. So, you know, USC's, slot receiver when Amon Ra moved to the outside is Drake London at you know six five and two forty basically now or something like that. So uh it doesn't really matter the body size, but like he moved to the outside and that's that's where he had his big game against Washington State. And I I think, you know, I'm sure he'll get asked about it, but when we asked him about it before, you know, he, he would get kind of annoyed by the the idea that he was sort of pigeonholed into just a slot position. I think that's because you know, he worked a lot on trying to be that outside guy. Now, would I put him outside like right away? Probably not. I think I would start him on as a slot receiver. And I think that's arguably where he did his most damage at USC. And there's a reason again, why his second year was a little bit better than his third year. And I think that has something to do with it, but uh, he's certainly capable of, of playing either. That's, that's interesting. Um, uh, it, it kind of all plays into that kind of chip on the shoulder mentality that seems like he has. So yeah, that's, that's interesting that he probably thinks he'll be more of an outside or can be more of an outside receiver than, than advertised. And, and, you know, we, we know so little about the Lions scheme right now that, that we, we, I mean, maybe we see that a little bit. I think you're right though, that um, he's probably headed to more of a slot role to begin with, especially since the Lions kind of have uh, a one and two guy that that'll probably be on the outside. Um, but um, let's, let's talk a little bit more about his specific skill sets. Is there something specific that he does do you, that you think will translate particularly well to the NFL? Because, you know, a lot of things don't hold up necessarily in the NFL with a, with a whole new, um, you know, level of skill. Is there something yeah. that you think for sure will still persist with him? 
Well, I think just his instincts in general, uh, and like we've talked about his IQ, uh, yeah. will certainly translate right away. And I, I don't think he's going to have any problem picking out the playbook or any of that stuff. Um, I, I do, like, I in college, he was what I thought was a, a very solid route runner. And I think that was... You know, when you when you see so many guys, especially at the coll collegiate level, just have very little idea how to run a tight route, like just the fact that he could consistently do that, even as a freshman on, uh, it was pretty clear he's trained a lot with that. So I do think that and sort of just that short area quickness will probably translate right away. And again, I, I think it's really just a question of how the Lions decide to use him, how much we we get to see that. And I, I do think though, that I'm sure that will be one of the compliments that, that's paid to him sort of right away. It's that, you know, he's able to pick it up immediately. Like he's sort of a crisp, like clean player. Um, and I think that that'll translate, but like you said, like, whereas in college, his speed didn't necessarily matter. Um, and maybe even as far as to go as his separation, he wasn't necessarily a receiver that separated a ton. Um, was kind of a guy who you know would make catches in tight windows yeah. he could he was just smart enough to put himself in position to make those catches now when he's covered by you know a top cornerback will he have a little bit more trouble i do think that's like a part of his game that he'll have to focus quite a bit on yeah that's yeah i was Go yeah i was gonna ask to that like you know where is he where, where do you see him he's probably gonna most struggle to adapt to when it comes to the nfl is it going to be those bigger corners or is it going to be something else? Yeah. And I, I think it is going to be those corners. I think he's probably going to have a little bit of trouble in press coverage, just like against guys who are bigger than him. Um, but you know, that, that said, uh, he came into college and immediately looked like he'd been there forever. Um, it's not like there was that one year that he needed to get into it. So it's certainly possible that he could adjust that quickly at the NFL level. But I, I do just think it really is going to be a matter of that separation. I, that is one thing that uh, if he does struggle early, I would imagine it it's that. Um, and again, that has so much to do with whatever routes he's asked to run or whatever position he's in. And that's one of the reasons why I think he would be better off in the slot, just a um, little bit more flexibility in terms of that, especially in press coverage. Yeah. that, that That's an interesting point too, because, I, I look at his play and it, it can be physical at times. Like that is a guy that, that is unafraid of, of contact. And, but, but in college, you don't really see a lot of press coverage. And so that's, yeah, yeah that's something that we just don't, don't really know if he has the skills to beat. I think he has a mentality to, to potentially beat man, uh, press coverage, but um, does he have the skill set? Does he have the physical tools? That's, that's something that we really don't know yet. Yeah. Um, I, I, I have this question that I've asked everybody, uh, in, in mm. regards to the Lions rookies. And you may have already answered this one uh, when he was in the backfield, but if there was one player, one moment from Amon Ross St. Brown's career that defines him as a player and person, what was it? Yeah, I mean, they, I really just come back to that yeah. run play, you know, and you talk about his physicality. Like, he, what, I mean, if you watch it, like, he runs straight at a guy. Yeah. I mean, this is not like a, you know, a uh, small receiver just sort of running away from contact, like he'll lower his shoulder uh, and do that. I, I wish I had a better, another one for you I'm trying to think. Um, yeah. I mean, he, we talked about it a little bit earlier, just his chemistry and how he immediately connected with Keaton Slovis. But I remember that first game that he played, uh, you know, Keaton Slovis, I know, was very nervous, um, as one would be, you know, right after JT Daniels tore his ACL and, you know, Keaton Slovis thrust into literally the first game of the season. And Amon Ra was just kind of that, uh, like he leaned on him very clearly in that game. And Amon Ra had a way of like, there was a pride to him and that, like, I think he knew that it fell on his shoulders uh, to sort of carry Keaton through that. And he is, he is that type of person. And I do think, you know, as far as the lions go, like, I think that skill will translate right away too. And I don't know what that receiver room is like now. And maybe no one does since it's like completely turned over over the course of the last right. year. But uh, I do think just his presence, like people will respect him in that room for that. And I think that, you know, that game also said a lot about just his mentality, but really when I come back to just his, 
what kind of like tough player he is like that, that run play against Colorado certainly sticks out. Someone to lean on would definitely seem like probably in the profile of Jared Goff. That does sound <laughs> just a matter of that, if it's that or Quintez Cephas or why, I don't even know who the third wide receiver is at this point. Just... Tyrell Williams. Oh, yeah. Tyrell Perfect. Williams, I guess. Perriman, yeah. Um, yeah. It, it's... I know a, I know a lot of people, especially, you know, the fact that I, I actually covered the Rams for a couple of years and mm-hmm. was there when Jared Goff was drafted. And so I spent a lot of time around Jared Goff and uh, Amon Ra, I think in a best case scenario, uh, people would love to hear that he might be a Robert Woods type. Sure. And I, I think that's kind of a fair ceiling comparison. Uh, I think Robert Woods is probably a little bit better, but uh, but you never know. I mean, the, Robert Woods also had several quiet years in the NFL to start before he sort of blew up with the Rams. So it, uh, I certainly think that's sort of the trajectory he would like to be on. Just we, checking Robert Woods, not in our list cast, Jeremy. So that's a problem. Top 10 receivers. Yeah. Not, yeah. Yeah. Um, well, yeah, he's not going to be a top 10 receiver right <laughs> out, out of the box, but, but I, why I do, not? I do see some Lions fans with, with very, I mean, a lot of Lions fans really love this guy. And I think part of it is the mentality. Part of it is that, uh, you know, a lot of people think they may have gotten a second round talent in the fourth round. Um, but since you have, you know, a fair amount of knowledge on the Lions as well, what do you think first year expectations should? could be with with a monitor I, I mean i see lions fans talking offensive player of the year i think or offensive rookie of the year i should say obviously that's a little bit pie in the sky but but you know what like is is 600 yards 700 yards is that is that too much for a, a guy that might be playing predominantly in the slot i don't think so okay. uh, i certainly think he could live up to that and like i said you know this whole time he has a history of just sort of jumping into a situation and you know starting right away and having no issue Uh, from the jump uh, I think that could be the situation I think you know just the fact that there isn't really like a standout number one guy in the receiving core uh, unless you count TJ Hawkinson I guess uh, sort of sort of lends itself to that and I think I don't know he sort of strikes me as someone who will not have like a big like many big games but will always sort of be there reliably and you know, he has proven that he has the ability to be sort of a red zone threat. I think that's one thing that I would like to see more out of him in the NFL. That might be a little harder to translate, but I wouldn't doubt if they were creative enough, you know, in the red zone that he's the type of guy who could take advantage of some, you know, some nifty routes and some shifts that, you know, would put him in a good spot. I, I think he could, he could develop into that in a similar way that Robert Woods is. All right, last one for me. Um, just kind of to wrap things up, is, is there anything you think Lions fans should know about Amon Ross St. Brown that they might not know or just kind of like maybe give a, a pitch, uh, an Amon Ross St. Brown pitch to the Lions fan base? Yeah, I mean, I think we covered most of it, but uh, the one thing that surprised me most, uh, and I'm sort of with their, with Lions fans on this in that uh, I was quite surprised that he lasted as long as he did. Um I think if he would have gone been able to go to the NFL after last year, I think we would have been talking about a second round pick probably. Um, And I thought it was interesting. uh, One of USC uh, uh, official who works with USC also used to work with John Dorsey uh, when he was in the NFL. And he actually was texting with me as this happened and, and told me that kind of like you said, that they had their eye on him from for a while and that he sort of fit their system perfectly and i like as as much as i know about the lions offense as it stands right now like it certainly seems to me like he is the type of guy that would fit in well and like we've sort of referenced like he has that very detroit feel to him there's a chip on his shoulder he's gonna be a type of guy he's not gonna complain ever there's no like uh diva-ness to him at all you're never going to get that so I think he will fit in well with Detroit I think he'll endear himself just to the fact that he you know has potential and is not like is someone Lions fans can get excited about uh, because we don't necessarily know what his ceiling is compared to maybe some of the other guys that are on their team Um, and I think you know if he continues at the pace that he's at like I, I don't doubt that he could be a receiver that you know, has thousand yard seasons. Do I think he's a number one guy in the NFL? Probably not, but I do think he could be a very productive number two uh, if they're 
was that number one guy that that could step up. And if he was your number three in an offense going forward, I, I think the you know you're in a good spot. I love that dropping some sources there at the end to, to get the Lions fans mm-hmm. fired up. Mm-hmm. That's Ryan Karchi from the LA I've Times. Got, hold up, hold up. Oh, you got I, one more I for me? I, I was going to say, I haven't had enough weird stories about <laughs> Amon Ra, St. Brown, and his family. I, I'm imagining okay. if you got to see anything else with, like, just, I, I don't know, because I imagine when he's, like, I imagine in my head, I want to believe that a lot of his chip came from having to deal with listening to Foreigner growing up. But, <laughs> what like, I'm just curious with that, again, besides just the competitive, like, do you see anything from that family dynamic, anything that was just, I don't know, more of a character for these guys? Well, their dad has a lot enough character for all of them. I think <laughs> he sort of like sucked that, like he hoards the character of the family. And so we uh, might see him around Detroit sometime. Oh, you'll hear him. Yeah. Is it fair to, is it fair to he, say uh, he gives off like LeVar Ball energy? Uh, there was actually a story a while back that was kind of like, oh, this is the the ball family of college football. Ah. Now, mm. I don't, he's not as much bravado, I would guess. Okay. Like, he's not gonna Yeah, make- I don't think he has the negative connotations of LeVar <laughs> no, Ball here. Yeah. Not, not as much, not as much for that. Maybe in terms of like selling his products, sure. he's very similar. <laughs> um, but no, uh, John Brown is an intimidating guy. I'll say that. And I think you can see sort of the intensity and where it comes from and how they're the most similar in that sense. Have I shuddered a couple of times when John Brown called me after I wrote a story about his son? Maybe. Uh, what, what's that phone call like? Well, like what, what's, what's the first words out of his mouth there? What is it like? It's like, Brian. It's like, yeah, what, it's what's, usually, what's there's not usually a dad. meeting he just kind of jumps into it uh, <laughs> but he is certainly someone who i will say if you wanted like an unvarnished take about clay helton or something like <laughs> usc or like usc is not playing my son enough sort of thing you could get that from him if you wanted it um yeah. but he uh certainly someone you want to have on your side you know <laughs> you had my cur- you had my curiosity but now you have my attention <laughs> But yeah, he's a he he's quite a guy. But he uh, certainly, I mean, it's rubbed off on his sons in the best possible way, I, I think. And I, uh, it certainly worked for Amonra. And he's not, it's not a like Lavar Ball sort of medal with your life sort of situation. Mm-hmm. It's yeah, maybe you did start him as a five year old doing uh, curls <laughs> like that. Sure, like maybe that's a little overkill. But you know, I think John Brown would say it worked. Yeah. So there you go. What's the harm? <laughs> Results speak for themselves. Yeah. Uh, again, that's Ryan Karchi, the, the USC beat writer over at the LA Times. Um, Ryan, uh, do you, if, if you want, uh, I'll give you a minute here to, to plug your stuff where the people can find you if they want to read more about uh, USC or, or whatever you, you, I mean, since you're a Michigan man, maybe you got some Detroit takes on your, on your socials. <laughs> uh, well, I try to, I try to limit the Michigan takes mostly because I, uh, USC fans already don't love the fact that I went to Michigan. <laughs> so I don't know why they what they have against Michigan people, but I actually think they're the two programs are very similar. So uh, I don't they, know if that's I don't know if that's good praise. Oh, I mean, <laughs> that, that's not that, praise that, for either team. No, no, no. <laughs> I mean that in the best and worst way. <laughs> uh, that way. Um, but yeah, no, I uh, definitely check out latimes.com uh, any of our coverage on usc and you can follow me on twitter at ryan underscore karchi it's k-a-r-t-j-e so you might get some sad lions takes in there every now and again if you just want a little sprinkle of that we we, we get plenty of that on the timeline <laughs> I was gonna say, we provide <laughs> plenty of that on the timeline what are you talking yeah. about <laughs> Well, thank you for for your time, Ryan. Appreciate it. Uh, Some great insight, and I appreciate all of you listening. Uh, We'll be back with the main podcast on Sunday. We'll be doing a live locker room, except it's not called locker room anymore. It's called green room now, so update your apps if you want to join us uh, for that every Saturday morning. But until next time, thanks for joining us. It's chaos. Be kind.